Welcome back to Monster Monday. Today we're going to delve into Volo's Guide to Monsters. For a nasty little dude, it's time to take a look at the Mean Lock. The Mean Lock are a small fey creature. They're basically uh, evil creatures, corrupted fey. Um, deformed, and they're, they're a great, very versatile creature that uh, for sure can be found in woodland settings, forests, that sort of thing, but they can even be flexibly adapted to urban environments, um, kind of rural farming community environments, or even subterranean adventures. So I like them because they're flexible. I also like them because I have some ideas about how you could scale them up for mid-level or even high-level adventures. Let's take a look at the Mean Lock. Mean Locks are deformed fey that invoke terror and seek to destroy all that is good, innocent, and beautiful. They primarily live in forests, although they adapt well to urban and subterranean settings. Mean Locks are spawned by fear. Whenever fear overwhelms a creature in the Feywild or in any other location where the Feywild's influence is strong, one or more mean locks might spontaneously arise in the shadows or darkness nearby. If more than one mean lock is born, a lair also magically forms. The earth creaks and moans as narrow, twisting tunnels open up within it. One of these newly formed passageways serves as the lair's only entrance and exits. Mean locks give other creatures the creeps and project a supernatural aura that instills terror in those nearby. So evil and twisted are they that a palpable sense of foreboding haunts those who intrude upon a mean lock lair. Inside the warren, black moss covers every surface, muffling sound. A large central chamber serves as the mean lock's den where they torment captives. A mean lock shuns bright light. It can supernaturally sense areas of darkness and shadow in its vicinity and thus is able to teleport from one darkened space to another, enabling it to sneak up on its prey or run away when outmatched. Mean locks have no form of communication other than telepathy. They can use it to project unsettling hallucinations into the minds of their prey. These hallucinations take the form of terrible whispers or fleeting movements just at the edges of one's peripheral vision. During the day, mean locks confine themselves to their dark warrens. At night, they crawl out of their tunnels to torment sleeping prey, particularly those who seem to embody all that is good in the world. Mean locks like to paralyze creatures with their claws, drag them back to their hidden den, beat them unconscious, and telepathically torture them over a period of hours. A humanoid that succumbs to this psychic torment undergoes a transformation into an evil, full-grown mean lock. This description is chock full of ideas for how to use mean locks. So as you guys are probably familiar with my format, I like to talk about how to use monsters in encounters, adventures, and potentially in whole campaigns. From an easy encounter perspective, right? Easy. You could have your adventuring party already doing something and they kind of stumble into a layer of mean locks. This description provides you with everything that you need to know. Just imagine twisting tunnels and um, an overall warren where the mean locks kind of dwell. And for me, when I hear this and I think about it, it in the black moss and kind of the, the creepy sounds and hallucinations, I kind of think of the movie Alien or Aliens, the series, right? Like when anytime they would go kind of into the aliens lair and the aliens would, would kind of, you know, build out whatever they were in and turn it into their kind of domain. That's kind of the vibes that I get from the mean locks. Um, and in a lot of ways, they're, they're, very, they're portrayed in kind of an insectoid sort of way um, as it is. So it kind of makes sense that they're, they're almost alien in nature. Um, the fact that they communicate through telepathy and that they could use that to you know, create fear and create hallucinations also adds to kind of the tapestry um, of descriptives that you can use when you're creating the encounter for this. Now, in terms of using them for a whole adventure, I think that also piggybacks off of uh, kind of a natural narrative that could be set like almost anywhere, right? But your adventuring party maybe comes across these mean locks uh, without knowing that they've come across the mean locks and maybe they come across a small village 
and the villagers uh, have you know complained that several of the children and even like one of the good wives has gone missing um, and that they were abducted in the night and nobody knows where they are and they've conducted a search and they haven't been able to find anything. Um, that could kind of be the lead in into making the mean locks into an adventure. And maybe the party investigates, they find this, this weird crevice out in some farmer's field that you know nobody had noticed previously. And that leads them now into the subterranean adventure featuring exploring the lair of the mean locks. Um, and they could, you know, rescue the children, re rescue the good wife, whatever that involves. Um, and you could stack uh, however many mean locks you want to stack into this mix for this adventure. So if you have a low level, you know, uh, adventuring party, maybe you, you have like three or four of the mean locks and, and have them kind of encountering the party one at a time. Because I think three or four mean locks could be deadly to a low-level party, um, considering their challenge rating two, they could be deadly to a low-level adventuring party if you had them attack en masse. Now, when I'm thinking about mid-level, how you scale these up is, is easy. Number one, quantity, the number of mean locks. So maybe this is like an established mean lock layer and that the fear that they've created just keeps spawning more of the mean locks, right? So you could have, instead of four, you can have eight or 12 mean locks kind of spread out through this labyrinthine system leading to their warren where the spawning pool is happening and making more of them. Um, and every villager above who succumbs to fear, you know, maybe spawns another one, right? So this, this process continues. Um, another way, of course, always the tools are available to scale up any creature is just by adding more hit points, you know, making them a little more tough um, in this case, when we look at the stat block, I'll be able to break that down a little bit more because they have some pretty cool powers as well. Um, they are small, but they have an AC of 15, which is pretty good for natural armor. And again, if you wanted to go to a mid-level encounter or adventure or a higher level one, you can scale these up with greater mean locks and just give them like an 18 armor class and, and describe it as they have like a tougher carapace, you know, like an insect. Um, you could bump up their hit points. Currently they have 7d6 plus 7, you know, make that, you know, 10d8 or something. Let's take a look at their special powers because I think this is where we can also get very creative about how to use the mean lock. So they have fear aura. Any beast or humanoid that starts its turn within 10 feet of the mean lock must succeed on a DC 11 wisdom save or be frightened until the start of the next turn. Now, I would say that at their you know, existing stat block, the regular mean lock, I think that's a relatively reasonable power, right? So they can cause fear and, and that narrative has been described. But as a DM, you wanna, you wanna kind of use this to your advantage in a descriptive way. Don't just be like, um, you suddenly feel afraid, you know, don't be, be, be narrative about it. Kind of whisper, you know, say that they hear like strange whispers and their, their name is being whispered all around them. And then they see a shadow flit behind them, you know, describe the hallucinations so that the players actually kind of begin to develop a little bit of fear. Because if you could transcend the imagination and, and kind of get your players to buy in on this fearful thing, without revealing that these are mean locks, without, without revealing the mechanics. If you can keep it narrative, the encounter will be much more immersive. Now, again, to scale that up, maybe a greater mean lock has uh, the fear aura, but it's a DC 15 or DC 16 wisdom save. Um, or maybe it lasts, the fear effect lasts for five rounds instead of one round. All right, the next component is light sensitivity. While in bright light, the mean lock has disadvantage on attack rolls as well as wisdom protect, you know. So light sensitivity isn't a big deal if they're underground. But this is the kind of thing, DMs, where I want you to remember that the relationship between DMs and players is not, should not be adversarial. You wanna create a challenge for your players. You wanna create obstacles for your players. You want to create opportunities for your players to think and collaborate and to come up with strategies and maybe even defeat the encounter that you've set up. Now, how could that happen? Well, as a player, I might 
delve with my party into this subterranean layer, encounter these mean locks, and then get out and say, we've got to pull one of these things out in the light. Or we're going to set up a series of mirrors to bounce sunlight and bright light into, you know, into the area. Or we're going to use a, a bunch of light cantrips and torches, right? So if your party is clever and they work together and they come up with a great strategy, don't take that away from them. Allow them to come up with a great strategy to encounter the mean locks and kind of level the playing field by using light as a weapon to keep the mean locks, you know, at a disadvantage, literally, mechanically at a disadvantage. Um, so that's that's my little, you know, pep talk on using the weaknesses of a monster and, and making it count and allowing that to be something that the players can actually tactically and strategically use to their advantage. All right, now back to the powers of the mean lock. This is pretty incredible, okay? Shadow teleport. Now this is given a recharge of five or six. So that means for them to do it again every round, you have to roll a d6. If they roll a five or a six, they can do that again. If they don't, then they can't use that power. But it's that's still pretty amazing. All right, so as a bonus action, the mean lock can teleport to an unoccupied space within 30 feet of it, provided that both the space it's teleporting from and its destination are in dim light or darkness. The destination need not be within line of sight. Um, that, let me recap that. Going from a dark place to another dark place within 30 feet, and it doesn't have to be line of sight. And it's a bonus action. So let's say the, the party's encountering the mean lock. They strategically decide to blast out a bunch of light cantrips and torches. The mean lock is now at a disadvantage. It can spend its move to get into a dark spot away from the party's light. It has a movement speed of 30. And it has a bonus action to use shadow teleport. It can teleport to another part of the cave and it doesn't even have to see where it's teleporting to. So it could teleport to another side passage that runs parallel but does not connect close by anywhere. And now it has a big protective wall of, of earth and stone between it and the party. So the mean locks are not easy to catch or corner so as a DM, use that to make them more challenging. They're not, um, they're not beasts with zero intelligence. Like they have an intelligence of 11. So it, it would stand to reason that they would know basic survival and self-preservation. So they might not just fight to the death in an encounter if they've found themselves facing adversaries who are tactical and strategic. So you can kind of stretch out this, this process beyond just more an encounter where it's, you know, fight, 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 kill. Maybe they disappear and then they go somewhere else. So they're an elusive opponent. And the party of investigators and heroes who want to rescue all these people, maybe they're even able to rescue the missing children and, and the, the, um, the good wives who are, are captured or whoever you have captured, right? Maybe they're able to do that, but they're not able to track down the mean locks. And until they track down and wipe out the mean locks, maybe they don't, you know, they can't leave the area because more disappearances will come. More mean locks will be spawned by the people's fear of them. So this kind of takes it from a simple encounter into a longer term adventure. And maybe some of those intersecting um, underground tunnels don't all directly lead to the Warren. What if there was uh, a way to get to the Warren without going through a physical tunnel? Because they can shadow teleport. Now, I'm just thinking, like, why would they have their Warren have a tunnel going one way in, one way out? Um, maybe they would to bring victims there. Okay, fair. But maybe they have a couple side tunnels that don't lead to anywhere that literally are just adjacent but not directly connected. And when a mean lock needs to bug out, they can teleport into that side tunnel because their shadow teleport does not require it to be in line of sight. That's pretty, pretty cool. Pretty cool. If you wanted to scale up the mean locks using just shadow teleport, you can make it, you know, a three in six chance 
So now they, they're, the odds are more than likely that they're going to be able to shadow teleport every round. Okay. Um, their actions are interesting. So they have the claw attack. It's plus four to hit, reach of five feet. Um, it does 2d4 plus two slashing damage, and the target must succeed on a DC 11 con save or be paralyzed for one minute. One minute is 10 rounds. It's a long time to be paralyzed. The target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on a, on a success. Okay, so just at its basic level, that's kind of a cool thing. Every one of their basic attacks has the ability to render a victim paralyzed. Now, if you wanted to scale these guys up and make greater mean locks for your mid-level adventuring parties, you can make the DC higher on the con save, make it 15 or 16, and make the duration of this longer. Or make it so that you know it lasts for five rounds without any saves. So you you can, as the DM, you can modify and scale these to fit the levels of the adventuring parties that you're dealing with. Okay, now there is a little special bonus block of text that I want to read at this point. Because as we start to think like, how could these guys be part of a high level encounter or high level adventure, that dovetails nicely. And this should help in terms of fostering ideas for connecting high level things and maybe even a longer running campaign concept. Up to four mean locks can telepathically torment one incapacitated creature filling its mind with disturbing sounds and dreadful imagery. Participating mean locks can't use their telepathy for any other purpose during this time, though they can move about and take actions and reactions as normal. This torment has no effect on a creature that is immune to the frightened condition. If the creature is susceptible and remains incapacitated for one hour, the creature must make a wisdom save, taking 10 3d6 psychic damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. The save DC is 10 plus the number of mean locks participating in the torment, considering only those that remain within sight of the victim for the entire hour and aren't incapacitated during it. The process can be repeated. A humanoid that drops to zero hit points as a result of this damage instantly transforms into a mean lock at full health and under the DM's control. Only a wish spell or divine intervention can restore a transformed creature to its former state. Now you might have, if you're an evil DM, you might have been like, ooh, Bill, that is wicked. Capture a member of the party and psychically torture them until they turn into a mean lock. You could do that. That might be kind of a dick move though. But, um, but here's what I would say you could do with this. You could take an ally of the party, a very important NPC, someone who the party cares about, and you could have that person be captured. And maybe there's someone of a higher level, a, a, a very malevolent fae, who knows where the warren of the mean locks is located, and who would like to play a little game on the party. And maybe is like, you know, I'll tell you where it is, but uh, when you go rescue your friend, you have to bring me back something in return, something that the mean locks took from me. And the party, you know, maybe agrees to this, right? And it doesn't really matter. It's just a MacGuffin. Any, any kind of important magical thing, or if you want to link it to your existing campaign, it could be something else that's kind of relevant and important. Um, but this evil kind of higher level malevolent fae is really just playing a game with the party and sending the party into their little fun pit to deal with the mean locks, to rescue their friend. But now you have set up a game that is literally on a timer because maybe their friend has been tortured for quite a while and maybe you know that that, that person only has two hours left. So you can literally set a real time timer and maybe, maybe you're nice enough to like pause your timer when you take bio breaks for your game. But like, otherwise I would upfront in a meta way, tell the party, this is going to be a timed adventure. If this timer hits, you know, the two hour mark, your NPC friend is dead. No coming back. So now you, you've, you're creating a timed encounter. Now, some people aren't comfortable with that, but I'm gonna tell you in my experience, 
sometimes being under a time limit for your gaming is actually good. It gets people, the players, not the characters, the actual players, to be motivated to make decisions, right? Sometimes they make stupid decisions. Sometimes they're, they make rash decisions because they feel like they're in a hurry. But sometimes being under the gun brings people together in a way. You know, having a mission and a definitive out time, something that they have to accomplish in a certain timely fashion, gives them a motivation that is sometimes missing from long-running D&D games where the players maybe have become a little jaded and, and sometimes they're just showing up you know, to be there and they're not really into and immersed in the game. But remember that as the DM, you are the salesperson. You're the salesman. You're, you, you're basically selling this narrative to the players. And if they buy into it, it can be very rich, very rewarding. So on a high level scope, high level enduring campaign scope, if you like to use the Fae in your campaign, this is an easy tie-in because you can have these arch villainous, you know, Fae of, of the winter court or whatever, you know, your, your setting uses, um, but basically some very malevolent kind of evil Fae who enjoys kind of torturing people, who enjoys going beyond just pranking, but like literally enjoys the torment and suffering of others, right? A truly evil, malevolent Fae. And that Fae is basically leading the party around through different things. And that could include this adventure, you know, with the mean locks. Um, and, and that, I think, is where we could go from an adventure into a longer running campaign. Because at some point, let's say the party wins, right? And they, they rescue their friend, they rescue all the villagers, they wipe out the warren, the mean locks are gone. There's a sense of peace and, and you know, uh, bliss and benevolence that has once again come around this rural area. The party are heroes, they're great guys. Um, and then you have them kind of move along to the next adventure. But two or three adventures down the line, you have a revisitation of this. And you have little missing people, but maybe this time it's someone really kind of important to your campaign arc. Maybe it's the son or daughter of a noble who's really important. Um, and that noble needs the party's help, right? And that could tie into another encounter where you've set it up to be just like, you know, very similar to the previous encounter at low or mid level, but now they don't know that you've scaled up the mean locks and that they're gonna be de dealing with greater mean locks. And those greater mean locks have, maybe have some support personnel. Maybe they have some red caps. <laughs> Um, or other fey creatures that are kind of evil and deadly. So those are just some thoughts. I, I, I found these guys and I thought they're really cool. Um, and in a lot of ways, I could see these adapting into other game systems. This is definitely not just a D&D 5e kind of thing. You could certainly use these creatures and adapt them in other fantasy role-playing games or even in any horror supernatural games. Like imagine running something modern, like a Monster of the Week, you know? Think of Stranger Things, think of Monster of the Week, think of Call of Cthulhu. These would definitely work in a lot of different scenarios. So hopefully this has been uh, valuable, informative, entertaining, um, but I just thought it'd be cool to kind of ruminate on how we could use the mean locks and uh, hopefully you found this beneficial. If you have used mean locks as a DM in your games, or if you've been a player where you've encountered mean locks, please, please comment below and share your stories. I love to read them and so do the rest of the friends on the channel. Thank you as always for your support, for subscribing, for liking this video, and we'll see you on the next episode of Monster Monday.
hello, it's me, Wizzy. I'm back once again to remind you to subscribe and click on the notifications button and also watch videos that are over there. And then don't forget to tune in to the next episode of whatever show you are just watching and crafting videos and DM tips and pro tips for vlogging and all sorts of gaming things. And also you could watch Bill eat food and watch other shows featuring Bill. He made me say that because he's a narcissist. Okay, bye.